for the opportunity to preach on the armor of light, the armor of God. And, uh, you know, I'm always reminded of boxing. I always kind of, I'm, I'm a football person. I, that's where I come from. If you're from Masson, Ohio, you play football, work in a steel mill. And I did both of that. And, uh, I remember, uh, watching an interview by, with George Foreman. He was born again, a born again child of God. He probably isn't Baptist like we are, or the real Baptist, but uh, anyway, he was given an interview. They gave him an interview one time, and they said, uh, George, you really beat up uh, Joe Frazier there. You took the title, and uh, he's, he was pretty beat up. I mean, when the cameras were showing him, and he's giving the interview, had bloodshot eyes. You know, both of them were bruised up pretty well, and you know, uh, swelled up and his whole face was swelled up. He's real tired. His hands and arms are hanging down. And they said, hey, what was the secret behind that? He said, I thank the Lord for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was giving God the glory. He said, no, 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 tell, tell us what the real, uh, your real strength was. He said, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they said, come on, George, give us some uh, something else. And he said, you know what he said? He said, uh, he said, what I did in the dark showed up in the light. You know, I got to thinking about that. That is so true. What you do in the dark will show up in the light. What you do when no everybody else is sleeping will show up in the light. It's not what's, in, what's done on the outside that's so much important is what's done on the inside that's important to God. You know, you can fool everybody on the outside, but you cannot fool God, the God of heaven, on the inside. He knows what's inside of all of us. He knows the sin that does so easily beset us. He knows what we don't put off that we need to put off, but He knows exactly what's on the inside of us. And even though you might not know it sometimes, He knows everything. God doesn't miss anything. You know what? If you got your knowledge before virtue, your knowledge is wrong. That virtue is that moral excellence. That's that humility. Brother, that's, uh, that's the Holy Ghost working inside of you. That's the Spirit of God. When I got born again, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, I received the Holy Spirit of God, never to die again. And that's the proof that I'm saved. Because if you have the Holy Spirit, you have eternal salvation. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, please. And then pick up Romans 13. Ephesians 6. And Romans 13, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Stand. Go to Romans chapter 13. Keep your finger in Ephesians 6. We'll come right back there. Romans 13. Verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us, therefore, cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Ephesians 6.11 says, put on the whole armor of God. This part says, let us put on the armor of light. Brother, to put on in the sense is to take on something or to adopt something as your own. To apply it, to appropriate it, to utilize it. The Christian life is about putting off and taking off and putting on. 
Ephesians 4 says, you to put off the things that mark the old man. We've heard it so eloquently explained throughout the whole last couple days. But to put on is to appropriate something into your life. It's to apply the Word of God to your life. It's to take to ourselves the things that mark the new man. It's to put on means we learn to think differently. Which means we learn to live differently. Because we are consciously appropriating the new life that Jesus Christ has given us. Brother, I don't know about you. When I read this, I think of a battle going on. You know what this Christian life is about? It's about a battle. A battle between truth and a battle between the lie. A battle between your flesh and the Spirit of God that lives in you. Brother, it's a war between light and between darkness. Amen. It's a war between good and between evil. It's a war between heaven and hell uh, and Christ and Satan. And whether you realize it or not, or even want to admit it or not, brother, that's a part of the war that we, we're in. And brother, I want you to know you can't afford to be ignorant. You can't afford to be neutral in the Christian life. And brother, if you try to be neutral, you're going to find yourself in a crossfire and in the most dangerous place of all. I want to say if you haven't been in the battle, get in the battle. Go back to Ephesians chapter 6. We're in a war. I've been in a war for 20 years. And every day I get out of my bed and put my feet on the floor, I said, Lord, protect me from me. Because the biggest war you got is you. The biggest problem is a person that's living inside of you. Ephesians chapter 6, if you will. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we, res- for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we're up against. The fight is not within us here. The fight is out there. But the fight is won and lost on your knees. You know what we're doing here? We're just picking up the spoils from the battle in here. The battle is won on your knees. It's won in your personal time with God. It's won with your relationship with Christ. And if you have no relationship with Jesus Christ, you have no power. You need a relationship with Jesus Christ. That means a relationship with the Word of God. Don't read the Bible. Let the Bible read you. That's the trouble with most Christians. They're reading it trying to correct somebody else. But what if we would read it and meditate on it? Which is not not something that's practiced today. Because when you meditate on it and you think about it, it'll start to change who you are. And it's not you changing yourself, because that's impossible for you to do. It's the Spirit of God, the God of heaven, living inside of you, changing what you can't change. It's the Spirit. It's the Word of God. And the closer you get to the Word of God, the closer you get to being like you're supposed to be with Jesus Christ. And the relationship that you're supposed to have. Trouble is, we don't think... We're not taught to think. Meditation will keep you out of a lot of trouble. I want you to know the church is not a showboat, brother. It's a battleship. We're at war, brother. This is a message of warning this morning. It's a call to arms. It's a declaration of victory. I want to say when you're born again, brother, you're born from above. You've been, uh, you're heaven born. You're heaven bound. But bless God, you're born for battle. We're in a battle. We wrestle not against each other. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
When you're born again, you're born to win, brother. And that's what we must understand. But I want to say three things real quickly about this battle that we're in. I want you to know it's an inside battle. But there's three things I want you to see here. First of all, we have an adversary. Secondly, we have armor. And thirdly, we're on the attack. Amen. So first of all, I want you to see that we have an adversary. Verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know what that tells me by that scripture? We must know our enemy. Your enemy's the devil, brother. Mark 13, 22 says, False Christ and false prophets shall arise and show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. 2 Corinthians 2 says, Lest Satan should get advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 2 Corinthians 11 says, Satan wants to corrupt our simplicity. It's Now it's important that you understand who the devil is so you can war a good warfare. Because if there's no enemy, there's got to be, there's got to be a preparation of war. We're in war here. We're not wrestling against people. We're not wrestling against things. We're wrestling against the devil. It's an enemy. Do you say, how is the enemy described? The enemy is described by a decided fact. There is a devil, brother. The devil's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I was reading a book one time. It was Peter Capstick. It's called Death in the Long Grass. Talks about fighting lions. If you want to get a good book, brother, that's a good book to get. It'll keep you on your, uh, on your toes. And you start reading that book, it talks about some of the greatest lions, the biggest lions in the world were two ton, two ton lions. And those lions would go in and out of those jungles, and Peter Capstick was an expert hunter, and he would have uh, uh, tents and things set up, camp set up, for people to come and hunt. And uh, there was one time in in 1942 where those, uh, those lions that were out there in the jungle started to hunt the people that were in those camps. He told about a story about these lions, and brother, these lions were two ton. And he said they could move so quietly through the jungle, you couldn't even tell if they were real close or, or how far they were away. And brother, they would, uh, they would just move so softly through the grass, you couldn't tell. Can you imagine a 2,000 pound lion coming up on a camp with people sleeping under tents and sleeping under uh, fishing nets and stuff, trying to keep the mos- uh, mosquitoes away? Well, these things were so quiet when they came up. But they told of a story of about three Italians in one tent. And these men had spent a lot of money to come into these, uh, this hunting, hunting place. And these three uh, Italians got in there under that tent and they were sleeping at night. And those lions came in, those two, two-ton lions come in. And they were looking for certain people. And they would come in so quietly. And all of a sudden, one of those lions would come into that, that camp And they wanted one person that was in that camp. They didn't kill everybody. They took out the one person in that camp. And they came and took that Italian man. They didn't go, they didn't go for the legs. They went right for his face. They bit his face off and they drug him back in the jungle. And that man bled to death. But you know, as I was reading that story, that lion didn't come To all of the people, he came to one specific person that he wanted. You know what the Bible says about the devil? He says, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You know what the devil wants in here? He wants to take somebody down. He wants to get somebody. I want you to know that uh, devil is a decided fact. It's a decided factor. He's a, he's a devil. And the Bible says that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know what wiles means? It means methods. You know what it tells me? Satan's very methodical in how he works. He's strategic. Satan's very spiritual. Satan is very strong. 
So the devil's a decided fact, but not only that, he's a destructive foe. Satan's already been defeated. Brother, we are, we're in a battle. If you have been in the work of the Lord for any length of time, you've got to know that you're in a battle. Once you stop, start set, uh, stepping out into the realm of doing spiritual things for God, you're going to have to, you're going to have to be on your toes. You're going to have to be prayed up. I wonder how your prayer life is. I wonder how the inside is. You know, we, we have an adversary and he wants to take you out. Not, not only that, we have armor. Look at Ephesians 6, please. Verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. You see that? And then it says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. He talks about a girdle there. You know what that girdle reminds me of? It reminds me of integrity. You know, integrity is more important than your skill. You know, he- integrity is something that holds everything together. You know, uh, truth and integ- integrity go together. You're to believe the truth, brother. You're to know the truth. You're to love the truth. You're to tell the truth. You're to live the truth. You're to preach the truth. But if, you- if your life doesn't line up with the truth, you'll just come apart. That's how the devil worked. He'll work through a deceitful person. He'll work through a lying spirit. You say, you cannot. You say you cannot get in the battle unless you have the girdle of truth. You know, Satan's a liar. Satan will come against you with lies. Jesus Christ is the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, Satan's attacks are untrue. He attacks us with lying. His attack on you is to bring a lack of integrity into your life. I wonder, are you wearing the girdle of truth? I wonder how everything is with you in your life. Are you sincere about what you're doing? Are you honest with God in your heart? Do you have a life of integrity? Integrity and truth go together. And then he talks about the breastplate of righteousness. You know, I believe that has to do with purity. Being pure. So not only do you need integrity to fight this battle, you gotta put on the armor of integrity, but not only that, you gotta put on the armor of impurity. What, I wonder how pure your thoughts are. How's your thought life today? How's your thought life this week? The Bible says, casting down imaginations and everything that exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. How's your thought life? What you see, you think. What you think, you do. And what you do, you become. I wonder what you think about. What's on the inside? How's your heart? You know the devil, you know how he works? He works in your mind. You know how you get, you, you know how you, you overcome the devil? By renewing the, the spirit of your mind. By putting the word of God in your mind. By putting truth in your mind. By memorizing scripture. But by meditating on scripture. Meditating on how it would apply to your life. What's God trying to change in my life? Because when God changes you, He can, he, He'll give you the ability to help you change others. It's not about you. I, I, people say, well, I, if I just get better and better and better. No, it's not about you getting better and better. Jesus Christ is in you, the hope of glory. He's already the best. All you got to do is tap into what He's got. You know what? I wonder how pure you are. I wonder how, how, how your life, how clean you are, how, how clean you live. Not only do we need integrity and purity, but brother, look at verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith where we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You know what that talks about? That talks about peace. So, you know, I believe what we need for the battle, you need integrity, you need purity, and you need peace. It's not your peace. The Bible says there's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. When I got saved, God gave me the peace. 
The Bible says, having made peace through the blood of the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether it be things in earth and things in heaven. I wonder, do you have peace with God this morning? Do you have peace with one another this morning? Do you have the peace of God in your heart? See, it's always an inside work. It's God doing something on the inside. You know, we like to focus on the outward, but God likes to focus on the inward. In fact, that's what Jesus' whole message was all about. There were three things that Jesus dealt with in Matthew chapter 6, and they all had to do with the, the inward life, the secret life, the secret life that nobody else sees. You see, you can be as phony, baloney on the outside, but you can't fig- feel, you can't figure out God. You've got to figure out God for yourself on the inside. I wonder how's your relationship with Jesus Christ? People say you're not supposed to feel anything. Boy, I feel a lot of things. Well, you don't, you're not supposed to believe in feelings. Who said? I feel all kinds of stuff. But I believe you ought to get your facts first. You ought to have the Word of God working in your life. And then what God will do, He'll give you the faith after the facts. And then once you get the facts and the faith, brother, you better get the feeling. I've got a feeling. i got a feeling I'm going to heaven. i got a feeling that I've been born from above. i got a feeling that i got the peace of God that passes all understanding. I have that peace that God gives you through only the shed blood of Jesus Christ. you got the peace of God that passes all understanding. You get that by having a relationship with the Word of God. And when you get a relationship with the Word of God, it starts speaking to your soul. You won't be so much worried about what other people are doing as much as you should be worried about what you're doing. How you're thinking. It's not about what I've done. It's about what He's already accomplished on the cross for our sins. I wonder, do you have integrity? Do you have purity? Do you have the peace of God that passes all understanding? You, you know, brother, if you don't have peace, you cannot make war. Everybody in here has got either peace in the heart or a war going on. You're fighting, you're, you're fighting something inside. You can feel it in some meanings. If you're walking with God, you can feel it. You can feel it. Some of you preachers know what I'm talking about. You get up to preach and it just seems like there's a wall there. There's somebody fighting you. And God will give you insight. He'll give you perception. When you study this Bible and this Bible becomes a part of your life, you know what God does? He'll give you a perception. You'll be able to see things that most people don't see. You'll be able to have the wisdom that God wants. You know what wisdom is? It's you being able to see things like God sees them. The more you put this book in your heart and mind, the more God works in your heart, the more God changes you, and the more God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. You need the filling of the Holy Ghost. You need to pray for the filling of the Holy Ghost. Every day you get out of your bed and you get out of those doors, you got to pray for God to fill you with the Holy Ghost, that He would control you. And when He controls you, you'll put on the new man. Well, the the Christian life is about putting off this and putting on that. Putting off this, putting on that. So you know what Satan wants to do? Brother, he wants to make war against your integrity with lies. He wants to come against your purity with lust. Look at Ephesians 6 again. Verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You know what that shield of faith is? It's certainty. I'm not hoping I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm not way hoping if I'm going to heaven. Somebody asked me if I'm going to heaven, brother, I'm going to heaven. I was going to hell, I was going to hell, but now I'm going to heaven, now I'm going to heaven, now I'm going to heaven. I never doubted it because he gave me eternal salvation. He didn't give me temporary salvation. Brother, that's what God wants. He wants you to have the certainty. Satan will always try to sow doubt in your heart. I don't care how long you've been saved. He always wants to put that thing of doubt in there. Look at verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know what that helmet represents? It represents deliverance. I've been delivered. Amen. You know what each of these uh, these items do? You've got to put them on with prayer. Nothing gets done without prayer, and nothing gets done without God. 
You know, we we become uncomfortable with that because we think our Christian life is about something we do. We think if we have a hand in it and we do something to work it up, then God's going to be more pleased with me. God's more pleased already because of His Son. He paid it all. Jesus paid my price on the cross for my sins. So I I want you to see we have an adversary, but not only that, and we have an armor, but I want you to notice the attack. Go back to Romans 13. We have an attack. Romans 13. The devil wants to derail your life. He wants to take you out. Verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Watch it now. And let us put on the armor of light. Now, I thought about the armor of light. Light is something you can't see. It's inside. So there's some things that are in the heart that nobody else sees that we must put off. And he gives a list of them there. And look up at um, at verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill... Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any of these commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love the neighbor as thyself. Watch it now. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing that... The time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So he's talking about an armor of light. And you know why? Because we're under attack. You as a Christian is not just putting on the armor, but you've got to get into the fight. I was, uh, I was, I heard a story about Count Zizendorf. He went into the country of Germany and brother, he was preaching and he met two men there while he was preaching in the early twenties. And he told of a faraway island brother over there in the West Indies and they didn't have the gospel in West Indy. And the fact that he told it, there was a great plantation on that island called St. Thomas, if you study it. He said on the island is a plantation, and that plantation, brother, had 3,000 slaves on that island. Men and women and boys and girls who had been taken from their homeland of Africa. And brother, now they're slaves to that plantation. And he refuses for any one of them to bring the gospel to those slaves. He said even, he even said if a missionary would wreck on our shores, we would put him in a separate house until he had to leave. But he's not, he's never going to talk to any of us about God. I'm through with all that nonsense, that guy said. So two of those young men sat and listened to Count Zizendorf talk about that. And those young men, brother, went and sold themselves to that slave owner. You know what they said? They went with their families. Brother, their church and went down to Hamburg where they caught a boat. They took that boat out to ocean, brother. They knew that they would never see their families again. Those men were 26 years of age. Two single guys. Their families couldn't understand. Yet they knew God had His hand on their sons. And when that ship, brother, was entering out to sea, those boys clasped their arms and those boys cried out to their parents, May the Lamb of God receive the rewards for His suffering. You know, I thought about that. We want a Christianity that's convenient. I wonder if there be any young men or women in this room that be willing to step out of your comfort zone and take the gospel somewhere where nobody's ever been. You know, at this country, you know, people are always talking about, let's make America great again. You know what America needs? They don't need another president, amen. They need some preachers. They need some servants of the Lord. They need somebody that will take, take the step of faith and step out and uh, do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I don't think it'd be any, uh, Brother Knox wouldn't be more happier if one little boy up here came up with his Bible in his hand and said, hey, I think God called me to preach. I would like to take the, the gospel to some place that nobody's ever been and give them the Lord Jesus Christ so they can put him on like I put him on. I wonder would there be anybody that'd be willing to step out I don't care if you're a little boy, a little girl. I don't care if you're an old man at the end of your life. I don't care if you've got, you're the richest man in this church. I, I don't care if you're the poorest man and live in a trailer somewhere. I want you to know if you've got the, you've got God and you know the Lord and you've been saved by the grace of God, God can use you. I wonder if you would step out and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always. Even till the end of the world. But what will happen when you do that? There will be an attack. There will be a war. But I wonder, do you want to be a... You just want to be a spectator? Or do you want to be a foot soldier? We need more foot soldiers. We need more missionaries. We need people to take the gospel and go to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. There will be attack against the armor of light. Go back to... Go back to verse... Uh, Go back to uh, Ephesians 6, please. Ephesians 6. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Christian, you need to know Jesus Christ is closer now than he ever was. There's two things Paul tells us in this scriptures. Christians need to wake up in verse 11. And verse 12 and 13, look what it says. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. He talks about standing, withstanding, and standing. You say, Brother Paul, how do you stand? You stand on your knees. You stand in total dependence upon God. Maybe the reason nothing's happening in your life is because you're not praying. Maybe the reason your church is so dead and forgot to fall over is because you're not praying. He says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. He's talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you something. You prepared to meet the Lord? You prepared to meet the Lord in His coming? Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. When He left, He said, you're the light of the world. In Romans 13, 12, He says, cast off the works of darkness. Negative. And then the positive, let us put on. Let us put on the armor of light. Go to Ephesians chapter 5, please. Isn't it wonderful to study the Bible? Isn't it wonderful to know God's truth? Isn't it wonderful to be exposed to His Word and exposed to His power, exposed to His grace, uh, exposed to the peace of God? There's nothing greater than having God's peace in your soul. Ephesians 5. And then pick up Philippians 2. Ephesians 5, Philippians 2. Ephesians 5. I love the Bible. Verse 8. For ye were sometimes in darkness, but now are light in the Lord. What does it say? Walk. Walk. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by what? The light! For whatsoever doth make manifest is light! The armor of light. I'm thankful for that. But notice verse 8. It says, For ye, personal, 
were sometimes darkness. That means darkness comes into your life sometimes. Temptations. The Bible says there's no temptation taken you but that which is common to man. For God is faithful, not suffer a man to be tempted above that which is able, but make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. There'll be darkness coming in your world. There'll be temptations come your way. But look what it says. For you are sometimes in darkness, but now are you the light of the Lord. Walk as the children of light. I believe that walk's talking about prayer. I'm, I believe that walk is talking about your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's having a relationship with the Lord. It means talking to God. It means having a prayer life. It means being in communication with God. It means while you're reading your Bible, you're asking God, is there some changes that need to take place in my life? Is there something, Lord, that you need to have me to put off? Is there something about me that you're tired with, tired of? We need to pray that the Holy Ghost will interfere with our prayers. That He will change us. You ever get down and you start praying selfishly? Praying about all your needs? That's selfishness. That's pride. There's some people just proud about their, their, their humility. <laughs> Bible, I heard a guy say arrogant humility is the closest thing to satanic pride. People proud about their humility. But he says, walk as children of the light. Children, they believe everything. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to believe every word. We're supposed to believe that every word has action. You know what I pray for every day? I pray, God, give me charity. And one scripture says, put on charity. The Bible says it's a bond of perfectness. It's what glues everything together. I'll take a charitable Christian over just a Christian that's not charitable. Let me show you what I mean. Look at 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 13. And I never saw this before, but as I was studying it and learning about it, 1 Corinthians 12 is connected with 1 Corinthians 13. And it tells us as ministers that we're supposed to watch for the souls. We're we're to watch if souls are productive. We're to watch if souls are bearing fruit. We're to watch that souls are giving glory to God. The scripture really came alive. Look at verse 24. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath what? Tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacked. That there should be no schisms in the body, but that the members should have the same care one with another. You know, when you temper an orchestra, brother, you tune it. There's harmony. That's where we complement each other. That's what prayer will do. That's what brings unity. That's what helps us to fight the battle against the attacks of Satan. You'll fight up, you'll fight off a bunch of animals and dogs in a group better than you will being alone. You know what the devil's trying to do? He's trying to separate the brethren. He's trying to bring schisms, if you will. He's trying to bring divisions. By doubtful disputations. You know what God wants? He wants us to be like a tempered orchestra. Tuned. Where there's harmony, brother. Where we complement each other. The opera, oppo, the opposite of temperance is a schism. It's discord. There's six things that the Lord hate. And seventh is an abomination. He that soweth discord amongst the brethren. Discord is where there's disunity, there's schisms, there's no harmony, there's a dissembling, things are untempered. Charity keeps the schisms 
away. It brings unity. It brings balance. The Holy Ghost gives charity. Charity is the bond of perfectness. Charity allows us as Christians to forbear, to wait. That's what the battle's all about. That's the attack. It's what, it's being prudent. It's being circumspect. It's, it's watchful. Being careful what you do because of the consequences. It's being careful. Being careful how you talk. Being careful about how you, how you work with people. Your relationships with others. By the way, young people, your relationships with the authorities in your life are the same relationships you have with God. If you don't have enough, if you don't have a relationship with the authority of the Bible, you have a real problem with God. You are untempered. You're in discord. You don't have harmony. God wants harmony. God wants unity. Do you have unity of spirit? Is, are you in tune with God? Is Jesus Christ on you? I know He's in us, but is He on your life? You know what? When He's on our life, people see it. They see the outward man perishes every day. He sees. That's the attack. The attack starts on the inside with the mind. That's why you got to fight your mind. Don't believe everything that comes into your mind. Your mind will play tricks on you. But the Holy Ghost will never play tricks on you. He'll always point you to truth. He'll always point you to what's right. He'll always point you to Jesus Christ. So charity allows you to forbear. It allows you to put up and allow God to put Himself on you. I wonder, are you controlled by the Holy Spirit? Are you yielded to the Holy Spirit? When you read your Bible and you meditate on the Scriptures and God deals with sin in your own heart and life, are you willing to make the changes that need to be made and truly, sincerely, and honestly put off the old man? Or do you find yourself going back to it again and again? If you find yourself going back to it again and again, you haven't repented of it. You're not serious about God. You're not real with Him. But that charity will allow things to be blended. This is what I'm talking about. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not say it, charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Charity is what keeps you in. Charity keeps the relationship strong. If I get mad at the church, charity will keep me going to church. If I get discouraged with some brother and sister in Christ, charity will keep me coming back. The trouble with most Christians, it's all about them and not about Him. But notice what it says. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. But I want you to notice what it says. And he gives the illustration here. The Holy Spirit teaches us through illustrations. And notice He uses instruments. That's about being tempered. That's about the harmony. And truly what He's talking about there, and you correct me if you're a Bible scholar, you come and tell me what that means. But I I look at it this way. It talks about a sounding brass. You know, a brass instrument's loud. If it's played too loud, it's pompous. It's overbearing. It's loud. If you play brass too loud, what's it do? It reverberates. If I don't have charity, I'm too loud, I'm pompous, I'm too proud. 
you got to always fight the pride in your heart. The pride is you thinking you can do it all yourself. Your pride thinking, well, if I know more about the Bible, God will bless me more and more. That's not absolutely true. Because there's a lot of people that know the Bible but have never applied the Bible to their life. It's never worked in them and through them. But you don't play a brass instrument by itself. And then it talks about a tinkling cymbal. You know, a tinkling cymbal, you use it more. It's, it's the gift. Uh, you're supposed to use it more. And charity causes the brass and the cymbal to blend. That Those cymbals are supposed to emphasize a song. So they blend together. You're either the sounding brass this afternoon or the tingling cymbal. Symbol. They're supposed to blend. The attack is on the blending. You know what the devil wants for everyone in here? To be going by your own tune. And going your own direction. You know, I got some advice for you. If you don't know what your direction is, get with somebody that's spiritual like your pastor and ask him what he you think he thinks you should do. And I can guarantee it, if you're not doing the little things, God isn't going to trust you with anything big. Those instruments are in there because it teaches a truth that those those two instruments are supposed to blend. But the trouble in our church is we got people going by their own tune. And that's where the attack is. The tax on those things. I wonder, are you able to blend with the church here? How about it in the ministry? So many men moving around from ministry to ministry, and I know God changes his mind. But you know what happens sometimes? What God does is some people can't blend. They can't work with people. They don't have a relationship with Christ. And when you have a prayer life... Your prayer life isn't about you. It isn't about me. Take the I and the me out of your prayer life and watch God move in a great way. I remember hearing about J. Wilbur Chapman. J. Wilbur Chapman was one of the greatest evangelists in America. But there was a man named Praying Hyde that came to his meeting. And they heard Praying Hyde was in town, but... You know, J. Wilbur Chapman, brother, was preaching to thousands and thousands under those sawdust trail meetings over those tents. And there was thousands and thousands of people got saved under that man's ministry. But there was one ministry where they couldn't uh, get a hold of God. There just wasn't any movement of God. There wasn't a flow. The wind wasn't blowing and the water wasn't flowing. There just wasn't anything going. And they heard praying John Hyde was in town. So they called old Brent, praying Hyde over to the meeting. The Bible says, or the, the account says that he was very stoic when he came in. Very quiet man. If you're going to have a, be a prayer warrior, have a prayer life, you'd be the most misunderstood person on the planet because you're just plain strange. <laughs> they called him in and he was very stoic. And they said, Brother Hyde, would you mean praying for this meeting? And I believe God gifts some people for that ministry. And they won't want to be, they won't want to be shining in the shining light or be out in the open. This is something they'll do in secret. Because really that's what prayer is. It's a secret life. It's doing it when nobody else is doing it in the dark. Your giving ought to be like that. Your fasting ought to be like that. When nobody else knows about it. They called old Hyde in there, and he says, you have a place where I can pray? They got it over there as an old wood door, about three inches thick, with the old keys, you know. He walked over to that thing, and he opened that, that door. Twenty minutes went by, thirty minutes went by, an hour went by, two hours went by. And all they could hear out of that room was a man's voice. Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, God! And after several minutes, crying out to God and begging God for the revival meeting, he came out of that door. They said they never said a word, walked out. That night they had that revival meeting. And over 500 people walked the aisle and was born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, what did it? 
The power of God. The power of prayer. America needs prayer. The church needs prayer. We need mamas that can get a hold of God. We need daddies that will spend some time fasting and praying for their kids. If things aren't working for you, fasting will do it. Giving up a meal. Giving up a sleep. Spending all night in prayer. Begging God to do something in the lives of people. So many times we're so critical in our spirit because we don't pray. So many of our young people are quitting. We've got formulas for everything, programs for everything under the sun, new Bible studies, new books, and I'm not faulting any of that. Please don't take me wrong. But what we need is to get back to the basics of prayer and giving and fasting. If you don't know what God wants you to do, fast! Fast and pray till the light comes through. And you'll see the Holy Ghost work in a way that you never thought. We're in a fight, brother. The armor of God. The armor of light. There's an adversary. There's an armor. And there's an attack. And the lion is trying to take somebody out of here. Let's stand for prayer, brother. Come and pray.